Hello, and welcome back to Phil 320, Deductive Logic. I'm Professor Matthew Brown. This is the third in our lectures on proofs in QL and the final lecture of the semester. Um, and today we're going to be talking about proofs and models in QL, how to use our proof theoretic and our semantic concepts to accomplish various tasks. I want to start by just talking about the relationship between proofs and models. These are two very different ways of evaluating sentences of QL. We use these different symbols, the single turnstile and the double turnstile, to indicate when we're doing semantic and syntactic analysis. The single turnstile tells us that a proof is possible, right? Um, we denote this with a single turnstile, and we know this is a syntactic style of analysis, right? It's not the same as semantic entailment, which we wrote with this double turnstile on the right here. And we talked a bit in the last unit about the difference between proof theoretic or syntactic and semantic analyses. So um, you remember on the left, right, single turnstile A says that A is a theorem. A is a theorem of SL or QL, depending on what we're talking about. Um, the right says, with the double turnstile, that A is a tautology, right? Similarly, the left here says that we can derive B from A, right? B can be proved on the basis of A. The right, on the other hand, says that A semantically entails B. If A is true, then B must be true. We don't have to mention the truth values of A and B to understand derivability or provability, but we do have to mention it if we're going to account for semantic entailment, right? So now I've, I'm, I'm saying all of these are different notions, and they are because one is syntactic and the other is semantic, um, but how are they connected? How do they relate to one another? Well, the property of some formal systems that we call soundness means that whatever is derivable is also semantically entailed, right? A proof system is sound if there are no proofs of invalid arguments, right? If every proof implies that there is semantic entailment, there is validity. So consider the conjunction introduction rule. Right? Suppose up to this point you have a proof um, where you've derived A and B. And suppose also that you uh, have determined, semantically speaking, that the proof is valid. Right, So A and B are either premises of the argument or they're valid consequences of the premises. In any model where the premises are true, A and B are true. Right, So we've done the semantic analysis of that. Right. Given the definition of truth in QL, right, um, specifically part three of that definition, A and B must also be true, right? Um, so the conjunction introduction rule, when applied to um, sentences we know to be true, preserves that truth, right? So any application of the conjunction introduction rule not only creates a proof uh, where we derive A and B, but we know that that must be also valid, a valid argument, because it's semantically entailed, right? Consider a new rule that we might add to our, our proof system. Let's call it modus pocus, right? Um, here's how I'll define that rule. Suppose on line M, uh, we have a conditional uh, of the form if B then C, right? Modus pocus, as a rule, allows us to conclude C, right? And you might think, that doesn't sound like a great rule. How did I get C? Well, yes, that's part of the point. Now let's look at our uh, definition of truth in QL, right? Um, if a sentence A has the form if B then C, for some woofs B and C, then we know that A is not satisfied if um, B is satisfied but C is not, and it's satisfied otherwise, right? That's how we define the truth of the sentence on line M, right? 
And, and let's suppose, for the sake of argument, that we know that that line is true. But we know that can be true in the case where B is false and C is false. If we allow the modus pocus rule in, then we have a derivation from A to C, right? But A does not semantically entail C. So the system of QL plus modus pocus is not a sound system. So conjunction, introduction is sound, but modus pocus is not sound. Okay, so that's soundness. We also have the property of completeness, right? A proof system is complete if there is a proof of every valid argument, right? Which is to say, if A semantically entails B, that implies that B is derivable from A. Now, both SL and QL are complete and sound, but not every logical system is. In fact, any system that is strong enough to express the basic arithmetic of natural numbers is incomplete, right? That was, uh, that was proved in the early 20th century by Kurt Gödel, right? There will always be statements about natural numbers that are true, but are unprovable within a proof system that is, uh, that is powerful enough to express those truths. Because QL is sound and complete, you can use proofs or models interchangeably to establish things like validity, tautology, and so on. And sometimes it's more convenient to use a proof other times it's more convenient to use a model. Let's go through the cases, right? Let's start with the question of, is A a tautology? If it is a tautology, the easiest way to show that is just to prove uh, that A is derivable, that A is a theorem, right? Um, but if it is not a tautology, the easiest way to do that is just to give a model where A is false, right? Same deal with the contradiction, except the negation is there. So the easiest way to show that A is a contradiction is to prove that not A is a theorem, right? Whereas the easiest way to show that it is not a contradiction is to give a model where A is true. The question of whether A is contingent, the easiest way to show that in the affirmative is to give a model where A is true and another one where A is false. Um, whereas the easiest way to show that it is not contingent is to prove that it's a theorem or that its negation is a theorem, right? Now, you may be catching on to a pattern here. Wherever you can answer the question with a single model or a pair of models, models are the easiest way to go. Wherever you would have to reason about all possible models, it may be easier just to do a proof, right? Let's look at some other cases. You wanna know whether A and B are logically equivalent, right? You can show this through proof, by proving, by deriving B from A and vice versa, right? You can show that they're not equivalent by giving a model where they have different truth values, right? To show that a set of sentences A is consistent, right? You can show that by just giving a model in which all of the sentences are true. You can show that they're inconsistent by taking all of the sentences as A as premises and proving a contradiction. And then finally, to show that the argument if uh, with premises P and conclusion C is valid, all you need to do is prove C on the basis of P. To show it's invalid, it's easier to just give a model where P is true and C is false, right? And so in this way, you can, uh, you can combine what we learned in unit six about models with what we've learned in this unit as well as unit four about proofs um, in order to answer any of these types of questions about contingent or logical truths, um, about equivalency, consistency, and validity. And it would be really to your benefit to keep all of these things in mind when you come to exam seven, right? Let's try to look at a number of examples of applying this sort of proof or model approach, right? So here I have six questions um, that I want you to try to answer 
either using a proof or a model. So take a moment to pause the video and work through all six of these questions, and we'll come back and look at them together. Okay, let's find out how you did uh, going through uh, each one, right? Uh, first, we wanna know is for all X and for all Y, LXY or not LXY a tautology? I think it probably is. It certainly has that sort of um, A or not A form, which is which suggests tautology. And so uh, our, our way to show that it's a tautology is just to prove that it's a theorem, right? To prove that we can derive it without any premises. So let's go over to Carnap and see if we can make that work. So here we go. We have for all X, for all Y, LXY or L or not LXY. I think the best way to do this is to start with a conditional introduction, inter indirect proof. We did something very similar in SL uh, back in unit four. I'm gonna start by assuming LAB. I wanna get LAB again. I'm using LAB because I can't use LXY. I can't have unbound variables, free variables. So I need to use some constants. That's easy, just reiteration, right? Now I have if LAB, then LAB. That is um, conditional introduction, one to two, right? To get that into a disjunction form, I just need to use the material conditional rule. That's not LAB or LAB, material conditional on line three. We can just shift that around through commutivity on line four. And now I wanna start introducing my universal quantifiers. I'm gonna first replace B with Y. That's universal introduction on line five. Now I'm gonna place the A with an X, LXY or not LXY. And it's universal introduction on line six. And I, I forgot my quantifier there. That's done, okay. Did you get something similar when you tried this on your own? Uh, let me know. Let's move on to number two. We wanna know is there exists an X, PX and not PA a contradiction? You might think, well, it sort of seems like it, right? Um, but pay attention to the scope of the quantifier, right? The exists an X, PX is only over the first part, right? So there is something that's PX, but it's not PA. Actually, that seems like pretty consistent, right? So let's see. So if we think that it is not a contradiction, all we have to do is show a model where it comes out true, right? So let's see if we can do that. Um, let's start with a universe of discourse that has two items. I'm thinking two items because we have to have one thing that is PX, and we have to have A be not PX, right? And not be P, not satisfy P. So um, if we make the extension of P zero, that satisfies the left-hand side, there is an X PX. If we make the referent of A one, then A is not P, right? A is not in the extension of P. So that makes the right-hand side of the conjunction true. So the conjunction is true. That means it's not a contradiction. Is that how you did it? Let me know. Um, our third one is that is the question is for all x px and not pa contingent. If it is contingent, we just have to show two models, one where it's true and one where it's false. But in this case, I think it is not contingent because if all x are px, then a is one of all the things, right? So not pa couldn't be true. I think this is a contradiction, and so to prove that we have to derive um, the negation. We have to prove that the negation of it is a theorem, right? So let's head over to Carnap and give that a go. To prove a theorem, we don't have any premises. We just, we just begin with an indirect proof of some kind. I am gonna suggest because negation is our main connective in what we're trying to prove that we try a negation introduction proof. Um, so we need to assume the thing that we want to 
uh, negate the thing we want to derive a contradiction from, and that's for all x, px, and not pa, right? So we're going to assume that for reductio. We got a conjunction here. We can definitely use our conjunction elimination rule on line one. I'm seeing universal elimination here is the obvious possibility. Universal elimination on line two gets us PA. Remember, universal elimination, you can use any constant you want, even if it is in an assumption. I've got PA. I can get not PA from uh, our conjunction elimination on line one, right? PA and not PA are the contradiction that we need for a reductio proof. And so I can, can, I can close out my subproof and conclude not AXPX and not PA through negation introduction lines one through four. And that has done it. I hope you had a similar answer. Let's look at number four. Um, here, we want to know whether these two are equivalent. And although you might think that they're equivalent because they have a very similar form, we've just subbed out the um, predicates. Because the predicates mean different things, or can mean different things, they don't have to be equivalent. And this simple model can show it. Let's look at number five, right? Number five, we ask, is this set of four sentences consistent, right? Um, and uh, if they are consistent, we just need to provide a model where all of them are true. But looking at this set of sentences, I kind of doubt that they're consistent, right? Um, we've got for all x, px in one, in one sentence, we've got a not px there in another sentence. I think that they're probably uh, not consistent, inconsistent. And so I'm gonna try to prove a contradiction based on this set. So let's head over again to Carnap to see if we can show that. So here we are, I've loaded all of the sentences in our, um, in our set in as premises in Carnap. And what I want to do is I want to try to find a contradiction. I want to derive a contradiction. Let's look at what we've got. We've got a universal, right? So one thing we could do is we could eliminate the universal on line one. That's an obvious one. I've got three existentials now. Um, and so, so we're going to need to use existential elimination, I think, to get anywhere with this. Let's see what we can do. So let's start with line three. That's where our not P is at. Um, so what I'm gonna try here is Q A and not P A. That's an assumption. I can get not P A through conjunction elimination on line six. I can get there exists an X not px through existential introduction on line seven. Okay, that's gotten rid of my a from the assumption. And so I can bring that out of the subproof. That is existential elimination on existential three and subproof six through eight. Okay, how can I turn that into a contradiction? I think I see it, right? I can do quantifier negation to move that negation out front here, not for all x, px. That's a quantifier negation on line nine, right? Whenever I uh, do that exchange of the negation and the quantifier, I, I flip it from one to the other. Not ax, px, um, if we combine it with ax, px, we get a straightforward contradiction there, and that is what I'm trying to prove. That's just conduction introduction on lines one and 10. Um, so actually, I didn't really need this line five. That was unnecessary. That was a, a dead end, which is okay, that happens. There may have been another way to get a contradiction, but that is the way that I try to do it. Now let's see about this uh, last question here. We want to know whether this argument for all x, if px, then qx, 
QA, therefore PA is valid. This looks invalid to me. This is uh, what we might call the fallacy of affirming the consequent, right? Um, if we had PA, we could derive QA. If we had not QA, we could derive not PA. But I don't think we can derive anything from Q, from QA and this conditional. Let's show this is invalid by coming up with a model. Like I've said before, I'm going to start with a model with just one item in it. I might have to introduce additional items as we go through. Um, in this case, I think I won't. I can set the extension of P to the empty set, right? That means that the universal for all X, P, X, and Q, X is true um, trivially, right? Um, uh, all P's are Q's when there are no P's, no matter what. Uh, we might think P represents. Um, if we set the uh, extension of Q to one and the referent of A to one, then QA is true, but PA is false because there's nothing in the extension of P, including the referent of A. And so this shows that the argument is invalid, right? What we've been doing today is just using our knowledge from unit six on semantics and models with our uh, knowledge from unit seven here on proofs, combining them together due to the soundness and completeness of QL to, to solve questions about logical truth, contingency, validity, consistency, et cetera, um, using both models and proofs as is most appropriate. You should practice this because it is going to feature centrally in the last exam, exam seven. So good luck with the practice exercises. Please get in touch if you need some help um, and uh, good luck with it. I hope you've enjoyed uh, this semester and um, I uh, look forward to seeing your final progress in the class. Um, and uh, please don't hesitate to reach out if you need to. Bye.